So can you guys all see that? Yeah. Yep. All right, so I just went through and I just kind of tried to do the simplest thing possible. I've got a type alias for some record literal. Um, and I've got an example record, and I've got an example stringified version of that record that will succeed to parse and will fail at parsing. And through apparently some kind of road to list magic type fuckery is the only way I can think of describing it. All you really need to do to get a pure script record out of this is to run accept on the read JSON function specialized to the sum record type, and you have something that will magically parse out correctly. Uh, so if I go over here and I pulp PSCI, and I run main, I get like exactly what you expect to get from manually writing all your parsing instances out, but like through the power of magic and wrote a list and other stuff that I don't understand at all. Um, the one that successfully set up to parse parses and the one that doesn't fails with this nice helpful type mismatch. I don't know what the issue is error. Um, but the thing that I found out on the train uh, back this morning was that, so at, at first I thought, oh, this is great, but I'm kind of limited to like, maybe I want to import a config file that's got this exact JSON structure and that's kind of useful, but not super useful. Um, because I'm stuck remaking the structure of the JSON in my pure script record every time and that gets kind of arduous. But Justin said that it's not exhaustive, which is really cool. So I could have a record with a whole bunch of extra fields I don't care about and only parse out these two. Um, and the other thing that was kind of neat was I didn't, don't know why I thought you couldn't do this, but you can just have the record literal and the type in pure script here and parse it out without building a new type alias for a record and then extract the nested field in there. And then you've got nested extraction of records almost for free. And so when I do that, I get from this a nested record, the nested fields out from inside of there, which is like also kind of blew my mind a little bit. And there's a lot of really powerful stuff you can do this, like not write a lot of Argonaut instances for things you don't need to really traverse deeply nested structure for, which is really sweet. So I think that's really about as complicated as it gets, unless Justin can say that there's something else here that I'm missing or not doing. There's no other magic. This is just really cool and kind of crazy how much stuff you get for free because of road types and road list. And I don't understand any of it and I can still use it, which is like extra sugar. I got a question. You said that you can define a type that has like four, like a row, a record type that has like four properties. And then you can use that to successfully parse a, a, a record that only has two of those four properties. I think the other way around, you can define, uh, so I can parse out JSON that has more. So if I understood Justin right, I should be able to do uh, here. Yeah. And then if I reload and come on. Import main again. Oh, there you got it. Yeah, and then that just works, even though there's an extra field up here. And if I run main, all the other stuff I had before works out well too. So it will ignore additional fields you're not supposed to parse. Does it work with things like null and maybe, Justin? Uh, yeah, there's an instance for like the, what is it called, nullable, I think? Uh, maybe doesn't work though, because like uh, it's always kind of a hairy thing about what people think maybe should parse to. Yeah. Still, I mean, this is like this is awesome for anything that you don't need. I think that this is this is kind of cool because it becomes the. I don't know. It means you don't have to like reach for the really big knife of Argonaut or eventually Argonaut or Codec Argonaut or whatever that becomes every time we need to parse JSON, and you don't need to deal with like a whole bunch of new types. I mean, this is awesome because I don't have to write new type instances for generic and everything all the time, which would be unnecessary. Um, and Justin's example has it. I was trying to keep this kind of thin for whatever I wanted to write or present on, but you can also do things like, uh, and then, 
no, I don't remember the syntax for deriving for it, but you can like derive new type instances for these things and it will still, it will parse them all out respect, like as you would expect to here. So new type deriving works with this too. So I can make that field A and then it would all work if I did all my instances the right way. Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, it should be what, uh, derive new type and you have to give it a name and then colon colon and then yeah, so you can do like, the rest. Uh, that's not right. Uh, derive new type space something, whatever name. Yeah. I'm gonna so, derive the new type first, though. And right? then uh, you have to derive. Dri no. <laughs> yeah, live coding is the seven different types of new type that. deriving. It's, it's derive instance, and then yeah. check the uh, chat log and just paste it. Yeah, there you go. Those See, live ones. coding is always a bad idea. Oh, there you go. What? No, it's uh, not called it from JSON though. It's called uh, read JSON. Yeah. I need to derive a new type instance though, don't I? No, you only need this. Really? Uh, what's the error you're getting? Yeah, oh. and then go over it and do comma MIA. What? Comma MIA. No, 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 I, I did that and it wasn't working. Maybe I didn't have, yeah, it says. No, 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 it's called reform. Ah, okay. Justin, are you updating the library right now to add in the missing instances? Is that... Couldn't match type string field A. Okay, that makes sense. No type class, oh, right foreign. This is kind of cool that this is like working as easily as it is, despite all. All right. Thank you, Christoph, for making an awesome editor integration. Yeah, so that, that worked. It, it compiles because all my errors went away, so now I know everything works perfectly. Woo! Look at that. That's magic. Oh, there's another piece of magic too, in that uh, you can get rid of your uh, read some record JSON, right? Well, you can replace the usage with read JSON and then annotate the right branch. Wait, what? Yeah, so you can uh, go oh, down no, to usage. Yeah. yeah. And then go replace it with read JSON, and it says like I don't know what this is. Yeah. But then you can go to write and it annotate it in parentheses. I can do like like that. Yeah, should work. What's the error? All oh, right, I'm using that function somewhere else. What line is that on? Oh, you commented out. Go back. Yeah, you, you commented the new type instance out for some reason. Oh, yeah. I don't know why I did that. Yeah, wow, that also all works. That's pretty sweet. Um, one question: You need, you do need the annotation on wrap direct, right? Because otherwise, it infers like an open row, or like an open record, and that doesn't work or something. Yeah, it gets very unhappy. Whoops. Yeah. I so I think it's because the the record is open, right? Yeah, I think that's I think that's the issue. Oops. Yeah, but I mean, that this all works out as well as it does is was like really surprisingly cool to see. 
because this is all type checked. Even the like, I, this might just be something trivial that I'm getting excited over, but I love that this is type checked. Like I'm doing record access here, which in JavaScript will basically shoot you in the face five ways from Sunday. And here, because all of these types are annotated and check out, I can access this A field from something that was just parsed from a fucking string and it just works. So. Yeah, it seems it's like it feels almost as seamless as in JavaScript where you just access these things, but you can't. Like, your schema is still checked before yeah. it comes in, and you don't need to write like some stupid Avro, whatever schema. Yeah, this gets very, very close to the thinness of just dealing with untyped records, which is what I really, really like about the simple JSON stuff, because I think it's gonna be one of those things that makes it great to sell this to people who think that typed programming or even type functional programming is too complicated or has all of this overhead because as much as I like the value of having all of the parsers and stuff that you get from ASIN or Argonaut, as soon as you show someone this is how you get JSON into Haskell or into PureScript, five minutes into that, the brain kind of shuts down in a lot of times and says, why would I do this? I can just do record access. So this is pretty sweet. <clears throat> One thing I uh, would like to do, uh know how to do is see I'm writing a program that accepts options um, and you can you, know, you can pass options to like the headline flags but like there's a config file and mm -hmm. if your program takes options of like field a b and c but you only specify the user it's okay if you only specify a, an option file with just field a um, then like how do you parse that automatically into nullable well, so this is um, the the stupid presentation library I'm putting together has um, there are five properties you can animate, but when you do the uh, configuration, you don't need to specify the ones that you aren't animating, um, and that's that's how I'm getting around it. So there's like there's no alt instance for nullable, but I do a conversion to a maybe and then alt from there. So you pass it all in, you get, I don't know, uh, two to null, null, three or whatever. And then the whole thing goes through um, as a set of nullable fields um, using a map record. Hooray, more rotor list. Um, and that's, that's, like, that's how I'm getting around that problem. Nullable, and that's different than Null or undefined. I know the PureScript uh, foreign library had for a while. Null was one type, undefined. The null or undefined was a different type. And each of these, each of these has like kind of different semantics or meanings. Um, and so then, what is how does nullable relate to, relate to those? Uh, nullable, I think, and and Phil will correct me if I'm lying. I think nullable is where the runtime representation is literally the null value. Um, which is why, I mean, I, without thinking, tried to do a PR to the nullable library and say we could make it a functor and all this stuff. But you find that um, because it's literally a null, a nullable of a nullable, um, it's, you can't tell which level is, is null because it just comes out as, as null, right? So it's, mm -hmm. it's like, it is literally a way of saying this value is either null or not null. And to do anything useful, you use the FFI to turn it into a maybe. And you say, once I've got this maybe, then I'm back in, in type safety and I know what's going on and I can, you know, I can deal with it like I would expect to be able to deal with a value. Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I can run through it. Like, I can get the docs up and stuff. It's, um, I, don't, I don't know. I might, I might be uh, doing um, Phil a disservice, but it... it no, I, I'm almost a horrible hack. It's just yes. that, yeah, right. <laughs> that was the phrase I wanted to use, but <laughs> I didn't want to upset anyone. <laughs> that was, yeah, it's uh, it's basically any interrupt with any terribly written uh, normal JavaScript library, nullable becomes incredibly useful. Um, just because that's that's how you do null and how you upset null.
So okay, so that that that, that that's like the best way that you found to do that. Yeah, I again, it's like I go from null to nullable to maybe as quickly as possible. It is it's literally just at the at the boundary to the outside world. I use nullable, and then after that, it it goes away because it's missing all the instances that are, are actually quite useful. Uh -huh. I think that maybe I'm wrong, Justin can correct me, but I think you want the null or undefined type. Yeah, there you go. Um, we do, oh, yeah, yeah, we had that. What? Uh, that probably takes a maybe instead of like, so you need to be able yeah. to pass it to nothing, right? So, no, 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 you, the null or undefined value level constructor oh. takes a maybe as its first sign. You can just use uh, wrap and unwrap if you want it as the new type. I mean, if it, it just makes it a little shorter, maybe. And this is too much effort. I'm going back to JavaScript. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's my fault because I forgot to put in the nullable instance to simple JSON. I'll go do this later. This is uh, this is too much pressure. Phil is literally watching me type pure script. <laughs> we, could, we could use uh, maybe, right? Um, I mean, the reason it's not in foreign generic is that you know it's generic. It's also generic, but you're not presumably going to have generic instances for your uh, read foreign class, right? Or maybe you do, I'm not sure. What do you mean? I mean, you could just make an instance of your read JSON free form, sorry, for uh, maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, whether maybe it's possible in a generic instance, I don't know. I don't uh, think he's up for the bike shed on that one. Uh, <laughs> I mean, my solution is just to like pass it through and use no, null or undefined. Yeah, I'm gonna read up on null or undefined. I wasn't. I like this was something I, I looked at on the train on the way back and realized I could do this and got overexcited about it. I need to read Justin's library actually before I pretend to be even a little bit of an authority on it. Don't encourage him. <laughs> this is awesome. That's that's my that's that's my shtick here. This is a really cool library, and more people should use it or at least talk about it. Yeah, I think this is a lot of. Uh really nice potential for the Rosa list stuff. I think this is like, like you were saying, this is a really nice demo for people who don't think it's going to be practical, right? So it's a nice demo, potentially going over. There is one thing I was actually kind of curious about. Um, I couldn't get block quotes working for this like I could in something I had with Argonaut. Um, Oh, I don't have that downloaded here. Um, I use block quotes to do it because it, it makes it kind of easier to, to write out JSON kind of like this. So I can do and not have the escapes here. Stuff like that. Um, but when I do this with simple JSON, it kind of vomits at me. Is this a valid way to, to write strings? And Wait, you forgot the comma, right? I did. I hope I didn't do that last time. I'm gonna feel really stupid if that's. I think you need to load again. Yep, that was just me being dumb. Disregard, this is awesome. I wish the syntax highlighting wasn't broken though. For the block quotes? Yeah. Yeah. I encourage you to fix the 1,400 line Elisp Haskell parser. Yeah, that's just my kind of. Yeah, I'm not going to touch that. My Elisp is limited to fumbling my way through the space max config file, not even full Emacs mode. We only need to like uh, lex, though, right? Christoph, not, uh, well, I even that, I mean, lexing's not trivial when you have all the string literal stru stuff, but I mean, we have the regexes somewhere, right, in the code base. But, oh no, I guess we wrote it's with parsec, isn't it? So it wouldn't work. Um, yeah. I mean, that's there, there is like an actual. I think it's a sh like a like a hand wrote recursive descent parser in the Haskell mode, and that's kind of like we just took that over. But presumably, like Elis has decent regex support, right? You could just like if we wrote it in terms of regexes. I mean, that'd be a decent thing to put in a spec. 
Yeah, I think it also uses this, the pause result to do the indentation stuff though. So um, oh, okay. that's kind of why that is in there, I think. But I'm not entirely sure. I don't know if it really much less stuff. You'll yeah, I'd, I'd really like to replace that by just having like a like an incremental Haskell parser for PureScript, uh, like a, and just using that to do some text highlighting. I pass it get over to uh, PSCID or something. Yeah, exactly. Could probably do something with like trifecta or something as something for uh, resumable parsing, right? Yep, that's the thing I'm looking at. Or you, your parsing lib, which is also pretty cool. That's the Utrex one. Yeah, exactly. The documentation is a bit like Luster, but it has like it can handle like ambiguous parsers and stuff, which is kind of nice when you want to do notation. Does anyone else have anything? I think this is more than even I thought I would be talking about today. Otherwise, I'll just get off the share screen. Talk about Phil's exciting new release of PureScript behaviors. I'm super excited. I was going to say I can demo it, but I, uh, I haven't set up try behaviors for the new version yet, mm -hmm. so it's kind of a hassle to get it demoable. Yeah, I, I am in the middle of uh, migrating to the new version, so I can show you a sea of type errors, but that's like, it's not a very interesting demo. It's really cool, though. Um, I'm fixing them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not doing that with you watching. <laughs> that is. I um, I think it's exciting though. I think that uh, up until now I've been sticking to the event side of things and um, probably detrimentally trying to do everything with events and say that um, you know at at some point I'm going to subscribe to an event that somewhere down the line will have something on request animation frame and everything will kind of just work. Um, and I, I think what I'm looking forward to playing around with is actually, it's the push-pull thing, right? The behaviors is, is the abstraction I want to do that bit for me, to do the sampling, to say, um, you know, effectively, if I'm trying to animate something, uh, my event happens at the start. So it says, you know, animation triggered. But then with a, with a sampling, I can say, well, how long was it since that happened? And therefore, what stage of the animation am I at? And so that's the that's the bit I'm playing with at the moment. Um, I did I, I wrote a PR for the function, then took it down because I thought it was way too specific. But I, I wrote this kind of with delay function that that would uh, take an event, call with time on it, then sample it on you know like um, milliseconds since epoch, and then work out the difference between the time of the sample and the time on the event. And with that, you could calculate progressions through events and stuff. But I really, I want to finish off the stuff I'm doing in this library and then go back and see if any of it can be kind of abstracted to a point where it's, it's more generally useful rather than it being useful for the specific case that you want to write a crap version of PowerPoint. <laughs> so you made me think about this. So I've been thinking about this thing related to behaviors as well. There's this uh, primitive in, I don't know if you're familiar with Fran, which is one of Conal Elliott's uh, original papers. It was with Paul Dudak as well, I believe. Um, anyway, so in Fran, there's a primitive where it's basically, I don't know if they implement it with polling or if it's something like the representation is more clever than what we have, but um, essentially what it is, it takes like a behavior of Booleans and it gives you an event of units. And it, it basically, uh, the events fire when the Boolean switches from true to false and vice versa. Right? So it's like, you could implement collision detection with this. You could say like, you know, am I inside the region or am I outside the region that maps my sort of space to Booleans and then I can look for the, uh, you know, the, the falling and rising edges of that Boolean signal. Um, and, and that sounds sort of similar to what you were trying to do with the, you know, some of your uh, polling stuff. And, I really want to be able to implement it, but I don't. I can't think of a way to implement it without polling, which kind of sucks. So that's right. something interesting to maybe think about as well. Yeah, I, th I think it's. I've said it before, but it's it's kind of cool going off down my own path 
for what I want behaviors to do and then seeing what you do and thinking, you know, we're, we've got this like massive chasm and I'm, I'm sure a lot of the things I'm trying to build can be done uh, more sensibly if I actually start looking at behaviors. Um, but the, the one I'm, the one I'm quite, quite proud about um, and I, I can't pretend I did it on my own was the, uh, the dynamic blocking. So um, when I first started playing around with it, I, I wrote some kind of um, debounce functions and you know throttle and stuff like that, where where you could just limit it at a fixed amount. Um, but with a lot of help from Nicholas, who's not here, there is no monoid musician. Um, I came up with this with this concept of of um, because you can create an event within. Um, pure script behaviors and you know it's effectful and whatever but because you already have that effect you can contain the creation and the subscription that you need to um to manage all that in a in a contained function so actually what i ended up with was this really tidy little function called with blocking which was um provided you have an event a function to get it from that to an event of a tuple and a thing um, where the first one is a number, that number is how long that event will block for. So it then goes back. And so the example I have is key presses. And if I press left, I do some calculation and that says, okay, you're moving to this slide. Uh, you want a three second animation. So now you need to block all key presses for three seconds. But because you can't tell you need to block it for three seconds when you press the key. And by the time you get to the point where you know it's three seconds, it's too late. It was really interesting to look at, at sampling. And again, I'm, I'm sure I'll look at behaviors and go, oh my God, this would have been like three lines if I actually, you know, actually looked a bit further afield. But it's, it's really cool to see uh, how to implement things in, in behaviors. And um, I know you mentioned the Flappy Bird example. So I'm, I'm quite looking forward to, to messing about with that and seeing if we can, you know, find, find some way of, of making it all very elegant because I think it is, I think it's, it's one of those things that will, will build and go like, oh wow, we're, you know, we plug these three primitives together and it's kind of everything we need. Um, so yeah, I think without just rambling on for another hour, it's the new update talking about behaviors and having parameterized events. I'm really interested to play around with that now, the, the kind of link between behavior and event is a lot more explicit and a lot more obvious from the from the types yeah i want to come back to that with blocking thing as well like i know we put it on hold but um yeah there's a there's a lot of uh there's still a lot of room for sort of figuring stuff out with that library so we should come back to that see like you say if maybe maybe and it sounds a little bit like fix might be relevant as well but we should see if it's relevant to the behavior stuff i think we can end up with a uh, pure script behaviors extra because uh I keep having Justin's voice in my head saying like, you don't want 60 RX operators in your nice little uh, ring fenced package. And uh, I'd probably end up doing that. So maybe it's time to split the two out. Well, so we have that type class now. And the other, the other interesting bit is, you know, RX comes with, like you say, a lot more operators. And then, you know, the interesting question is what can we do with behaviors if our event type has those things? And I don't necessarily want them for my, you know, bog standard, event type, but if we have them from Rx or whatever, it'd be cool if we could use them on the behavior side and get some, you know, get some nice functions. Um, so yeah, that'd be worth thinking about as well. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, I, I again, I, I don't really have a demonstration and I kind of hoped I would by this week. I think I said last time I'd like to, to demo this and, and still kind of pushing it back and back and back, starting new jobs and things, so I'm sorry about that. But a fortnight today, I will have a working demo and I'll, I'll build a presentation or something and it'll be cool. Promise. That would be cool. <laughs> it's always fun. Like all the behavior stuff usually ends up with graphics or some kind of cool UI. Right. And that's, I think that's, for me, that's the exciting bit. Um, just being able to see something and try pure scripts behavior thing is amazing if any of you haven't played with it. The idea that you've, you've got the code and you can fiddle around with it and then actually watch the thing happen. Um, it's, 
I mean, it's, it's obvious, right? But it is mind blowing to see where, like, even though it's like, there are, there's a chunk of it that's quite mathematically dense and you're, there's a, there's a formula going on, but you can, you can mess with the, with the values at play and actually see those updates in real time. And I think that's, that's what's exciting for me. And I think that's probably what's going to be useful for getting more people to look at pure script and think we can do reactive stuff in here. You know, we could, we could now go as far as writing browser games, right? We, we have all the, the fundamental things we need. Um, and we don't have to rely on a really massive amount of FFI anymore. And I, I think that's really cool. Yeah, I was actually, I'm preparing a talk right now. And so I'm kind of looking for examples to do live coding in. And I spent like 15 minutes, 20 minutes today um, setting up the like the Webpack dev server thing, which is like the most simple configuration you can think of. You just bundle the, the folder, basically, so you don't need any like Webpack plugin or anything. And I basically like, I copied that thing in. I started the dev server, opened it up in my browser, and as I was typing in my editor, like I was messing around with PureScript drawings, which generates these like, uh, like images and renders it to the canvas. And as I was typing my editor, like the canvas updated, like in like halfway real time. So I was thinking that it might make it might make sense to like take the minimal skeleton that you need for this like kind of creative coding kind of thing and make it into a repo and just say, yeah, clone this and kind of off to the races, play around, do, do something creative. Have you tried the uh, PSCI, uh, sorry, Purse REPL, whatever we're calling it now, um, in, the, in the browser, the browser backend thing? Dash dash pull. Yeah, that's really nice for live coding stuff. I had like a little web audio thing um, that I was using. You know, so you, I mean, it's not like Tri script where you can like maintain an entire module in one, on one side and like see the code yet. You, you like, you know, you're constrained to the REPL, so you have to sort of redefine things. Reset and, and all this kind of stuff, but um, you know, for small things, if you've already built like a library of uh, like combinators that you want to use, it's really nice to like drop into a REPL and start, you know, experimenting. Because then you can use you know the browser state itself for like the the library loading state that you need. Well, and I mean, in Emacs, it's kind of trivial to not have to go into like not have to actually go into PSCI, but to just redefine things on the fly from the buffer. So if anyone wants to do that, I'd be happy. You, you to still, I'm sorry. Don't. No, please. What all I was saying is like it's easy to just say uh, like mark like like mark a definition and say evaluate this in like paste mode in like a PSCI process that you have running on the side. So you don't need to switch out of your editor basically. I love. It. I see what you're saying. Would you like? What do you use for sort of? I mean, if you're doing live live coding, like you need some sort of state somewhere, right? Like if you want it to be truly live. So are you using the browser for that, or? or? Yeah, I mean, I was just making drawings, which are kind of stateless, and that, like I didn't even do animation on them. I was just like adding shapes together and like building like compound shapes. So I'd start with a simple shape, and then I copy that, add it, and then because the browser like. What Webpack Dev Server does is, it, it, like, as soon as it detects that something changed, it, like, rebundles the stuff and reloads the browser for you, so you don't have to like go into the browser and so. Oh, okay. It, it just runs main again, uh, which draws yeah, to the canvas. That makes, that makes sense. I was thinking more like the like what Pux and Elm do with the live reloading, where like you have your you know state atom or whatever, and then like whatever can be persisted gets persisted, um, but the code changes. You know. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, there's stuff that you can do there with like hot module reloading or whatever. But I, like one explicit goal was that I didn't want to mess with Webpack because I kind of want to get my talk done. So uh, I picked like the simplest thing I could, and it's like an eight line Webpack config script. Um, no, it that worked. Um, I'd re if you want some cool demos, you said you were looking for examples. I really like web audio for that stuff. You can either do like playback, or you can like get a hold of the microphone, a reference to the microphone, and get like you know. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how how 
how the like setup is, how, how oh, the sure. audio setup is at the venue. I always like you just like things because. Just kidding. Um, mm -hmm. No, anyway, I like I like that for like live demos, but just a thought. Has there has there been any kind of standardized module? Uh, I'm I'm saying this without googling, so I'm sorry if it's just annoying. But has anyone actually written the uh, the FFI and the the bindings for web audio and um, web MIDI and stuff like that in PureScript, or is that kind of was this an? It was a PureScript web, web audio library at one point, um, and there was a little Asteroids demo uh, that went with it that used it for like you know it was actually sort of like um, generating nodes and gain nodes and sort of wiring them all up and generating like chirps and eight bit sounds and stuff and that was really cool. But it's kind of bit rotted at this point, so it needs somebody to take it and uh, to kind of dust it off for the latest compiler. But um, yeah, I mean, it was it had all the nodes. It didn't have everything, but um, yeah, it was pretty nice. And when I I pretty much just crammed everything into a, a JavaScript module and just like wrapped it in half or something. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's but it's not really reusable. That's it. Just everything in an F. I, I just googled Pure MIDI, and I found like I'm not sure who this guy or. or Gal is I don't know, uh, but there seems to be a bunch of music related libraries in here. Maybe we should have like a, an audio slash music special edition of unscripted or something. There's like a lot of stuff going on. So this is my 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 reason for asking was that I've got this this Leap Motion controller from from way back at uni days, and the 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 demo I really wanted to to put together for a talk was making an air keyboard. So every time the tip of a finger went below the, the kind of joining knuckle at the hand, it would, it would play the note. Um, so writing the binding for that's actually not very difficult. And I was just wondering whether the web audio one existed because if it doesn't, or it just needs updating, I might take that on because I think again, that would be, it'd be a really cool demo, but with minimal effort. You know, I, I can't imagine it taking more than 30, 40 lines of, actual code because everything's already bundled into third party wrappers and whatever else. So, so I don't know about uh, web audio. I mean, that you need to you probably need to write something. I haven't seen anything for a while, but there's other things like if you just want to play like, you know, a, a note from a piano sound font or something, there's a sound font library. If you just want to play an MP3 of like, you know, a drum or something, uh, there's Howler, to, you know, the bindings for Howler. Um, I bet you could knock something reasonably impressive together like with one of those but i don't know about the web audio there i'll have a look around uh that might turn out to be really fun maybe i'll do a pure script drum machine <laughs> that'd be cool i know somebody did like a roland synthesizer like uh thing recently uh that was, that was really cool that's amazing <laughs> sorry i'm just gonna go and google that Yeah, and I think that's that's like one thing where just kind of really shines in that like the web platform already has APIs for all of these multimedia things, and then we can build the DSLs that make make that nice and not have to do with the procedural JavaScript APIs. I really would like to see uh, you know behaviors like audio thing where like you know your inputs and outputs are just functions of time, like uh, just you know. Not necessarily waveforms, but like, um, you know, they're, they're essentially functions of time with some codomain, right? So I think behaviors would be a really nice way of wiring all that up. Um, anyway, I was going to say, uh, if, if nobody has demos, maybe we can, um, I know there's a lot of people on, maybe we can like answer questions if anybody has any questions, like getting set up or what do you think? Questions about libraries, any of that stuff? Or somebody has a demo? Hmm. No? <laughs> uh, I've got some time to think about questions now. Yeah. I have a, I have a quite general question, which I, I don't know whether it's going to be helpful or, or whether anyone's here that can answer. But um, at work, we're kind of, we're looking for a pure script library to replace what is essentially a load of um, React bindings. Um, that that have been written in house. So this was, uh, I think, before the days of of pucks as a as a concept. So it was 
React and Redux with a bunch of pure script bindings. And we've looked a bit at halogen and decided, you know, it's it's too much for, for the kind of front ends that we build, which are not that impressive, right? It's it's a lot of simple forms and stuff like that. So I was kind of wondering whether anyone had any any experience doing stuff in pucks, basically, and, and if so, how is it? You know, is, is it is it similar to the React Redux uh, ideas where you have kind of, you have components and containers where your components are just a, a visual thing. You pass in all the information and they do it. Um, and your containers are the link to the state. You know, does that, does that concept still apply or is there a different model of doing things when you, when you add pucks on top of it? Or is there a better library than, than pucks to do what we need to do? Uh, what, what was your question? Like, I use Pucks and I have some opinions, but I forget. I'm, I'm not sure that your specific question. Uh, how is it? How is it? I find it, I find it severe, severely lacking. But um, that could very well be just my lack of imagination. And because, like, all, my entire use of it is like, uh, how do I solve a problem? Let me look at the demo. <laughs> and the demo only has, like, one way of using it, which is, like, a Pucks app is everything whereas i think like uh if we're more creative we could find ways to build multiple pucks apps to compose them together and do a into like a bigger more maintainable pucks app um but yeah there's like no demos that demo that um it's it's, it's, uh, it's you know it's very bad bones but it, it's i mean i feel like it's sort of the only set of bindings that really use React and give you like full access to like props and everything that you need to sort of wire everything up like you would in a traditional React application, right? Um, yeah, I don't know if there's anything that actually, uh, you know, I don't know if there's anything that sort of provides the tools that you need to build a React application in the traditional way without sort of using script React and just writing the load boilerplate. It'd be kind of nice. I know actually, Christoph, you had something a while ago where you were using like Pure Script React, I think, and then you had um, like some events or reactive extensions or something to wire it all up at one point. Um, you know, really yeah, actually, uh, no, what, what I did was basically before there was like the whole, was a Redux thing. I kind of wrote Redux in Pure Script and wrote the views, I wrote the views in actual like JavaScript, JSX, and then I wired them up with Rx. So. Oh, okay. But that was like zero point six, uh, like zero point six point eight or something. So that's that won't build anymore. Yeah, another one I'd like to see. It. I'd like to sort of experiment with you know uh, lightweight abstractions on top of PureScript React. I mean, like Thermite kind of started like that, but now it's this like monolithic pile of like core routines and all this stuff and. Um, It'd be, it'd be nice to sort of see, you know, React, the PureScript React bindings like have no dependency. They, they depend on like the F library and nothing else. Um, and it'd be really nice, I think, to try and find something like lightweight to wire it all up. I don't know if that answers your question, Tom. Sorry. Uh, that's what I'd like to see anyway. No, no, it's, it's, it's all useful. I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of expecting the answer to be uh, no one's really built a big Pucks application yet? You know, obviously there's the kind of standard example for halogen, but um, I I think I was just making sure before we run off on on you know a kind of a whim Whip. and hope that it all all fits together. Um, I really just wanted to know whether anyone had attempted it before and sort of what things they'd run into basically. I um, I briefly tried something like that. I pretty much well I'd used Elm before. And Pux seems like it's pretty much just Elm and PureScript. So React is different in that, like, it has this idea of containers and it's a lot more flexible. You can kind of do whatever you want, like, use whatever kind of architecture you want with it um, for how you hook up your components. So you can have, like, a, just one big tree where all your state flows down from the root, or you can connect the components directly. And that's what we ended up doing with the application I was working on. It's all in React to Redux, and we pretty much ended up just connecting all the components directly to the to the store, um, and we don't really pass anything down at all. 
And I, I wanted to see if I could do something like that in, with pucks, and I couldn't figure out how to do it. So I don't, I don't know if there really is a way to do it or, or not. Yeah, I guess like the architecture kind of forces that everything should flow down to, from the top to you. And then like the idea is that like everything is functions for right? itself. So, the way that you're supposed to use like components in Elm is that you, it's a set of uh, two functions, three functions, right? Like the like the functions for updating its like state or substate, and then you're supposed to like wire that stuff yourself, and then like the actual view functions. So you're supposed to call like the everything to render everything. So it's it's kind of hard, anyways, even for like people with uh, relatively small apps like. 10k lines or whatever but um uh, i guess he's not here today but you might ask zudov sometime because he built his uh, work application in pucks and the way he got around some of the limitations was he would just uh, write actual react applications using uh the pure script react bindings and he would just mount those on in the view so like um he didn't run into he he ran into like the problems where he need to actually manage like a component lifecycle and like mount mount stuff to the actual like HTML elements, and Pux doesn't really have a story for that, right? Like the Elm architecture also doesn't really. So in those cases, he actually just wrote the actual React pure script React stuff and then nothing else. So yeah, I think it's worth reaching out to Zidolf to talk to him about it. I think Phil, you you tweeted either earlier or maybe yesterday about the the kind of model you'd like to see of UI where I give you the the kind of the change in state and you give me the change in UI. And um, I'm really interested to play around with that idea. Obviously, I'm probably not going to get signed off to do it in work hours, but I'm wondering whether actually we could do something quite neat with that. And and what we'd get out is a much lighter version of, of the current approach, you know, you wouldn't need a virtual DOM, basically. Because, yeah. Sorry, uh, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I was just going to ramble a bit more and say, you know, you're, you're kind of doing its work explicitly. And hopefully that means that what you end up with is, is less code. Yeah. Um, sorry. Yeah. That, that's, that's the idea I'm excited about is that you don't have to use a virtual DOM and it's sort of, I mean, the virtual DOM, is a really lovely idea when you have complex component. Well, it's a nice idea, right? But it, um, if you have a complex component, it's very declarative. You can say, here's my model, the view is a function of the model, and then React basically deals with everything else. And then that's not actually true because, you know, then you have to go like make things lazy or use like should component update or whatever, right? Because it's the abstraction starts leaking a little bit, but it's, it's nice, right? And then then the thing that frustrates me is if I just have like a text field inside some big component or something and I want to change it from yes to no or something and I, there's a boolean backing it, why should I have to go and diff an entire virtual DOM in, in order to like, not the entire DOM, but like why should I have to diff any component apart from like one label or something in order to make that happen? When if I were writing this in JavaScript, instead of toggling a boolean, I would just go and say, you know, dom node in the html equals no or something right um and the reason i'm excited to do incremental lambda calculus for this is that denotationally it's very very clean right it's just functions and you can implement it at runtime using one of a couple of methods you can either just like you know um do sort of spreadsheet evaluation style where you have these like mutable reference cells with sort of uh, you know they talk to each other and pass events around uh, and that's like the sort of old school way where you do it with like you know uh, subjects or something right and then you have a little listeners that would you know when these things change go and change the DOM and then hopefully wrap these things up in transaction or something so you know sort of like thrashing the DOM or something right the other way you could do it is to use like an incremental lambda calculus approach and then you know your, your, your function from models to views is differentiable so you, you can run it directly and like get your initial view on the screen or you could differentiate it and say if you give me a change of the model I'll give you a change of the view that's cool, but it's type class heavy, right? So it's, it's sort of theoretically fast, but in practice it's slow because you're sort of doing a whole bunch of dispatch on type classes and stuff. But the thing I'm really like keen on is because the denotation is so clean, what you could do is take the, the functional core output and actually run it through a pre a post-processor or something, right, and turn it into what you would write in JavaScript, which is 
don't know in HTML equals blog, right? So, um, you know, who knows, maybe you could get the to to what work on it because the upshot is, you know, it could be really, really fast, right? Um, it could be like a really nice library and you have this nice of, uh, distinction between um, I'm doing, you know, production modes where I run it through my post processor and it's very, very fast, or I'm writing in dev mode and I want sort of, uh, you know, uh, fast reload or whatever, and uh, but it's slightly slower than production would be or something. Um, I think it could be really nice. But, and, and you know, there's, there's libraries, you know, James Street looks at stuff like this, I think, and uh, there's libraries that do this, but I think it could be really nice in JavaScript where we have like the functional core stuff and, uh, you know, type classes for the, for the development version. So that's why I'm excited about that. I just need, you know, a couple of months off work to write the thing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of the, the target in the distance I really want to help out with is, you know, like having that core structure and, and using that to produce uh, more JavaScripty JavaScript. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of cramming in as much knowledge as I can at the moment and probably at some point go pleading to Christoph to walk me through the compiler and how it works. Well, maybe we can do another one of those meetups where we just do an overview of the compiler, you know? We had one a while ago, but it's like horribly out of date at this point. Um, but yeah, it might be good to do another one of those. Yeah, I mean, that'd be great, absolutely. Yeah, I did, I did actually kind of promise I'd do something like that. Um, I think it has to be quite high level at this point, but you could show like, you know, here's the solver and here's the module stuff and you know, here's the type checker or whatever. It's like even at high level, I think it'd be really valuable. Yeah, I mean, just walk through the desugaring, show which fonts get desugared. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but I, I'm totally gonna do that, but I need a little bit of time because I like to do it like in a way that is not just me. Oh, and then there's also this that I just remembered, uh, but have like a bit of structure that I can follow along so I don't get lost. Um, yeah, so I can, maybe I can do that next month. Um, I think I should have some time then. By then. Yeah, that'd be awesome. And I, th I think probably a byproduct of that is going to be uh, like more documentation for the, like comments or documentation for the compiler itself. So that might be a nice side effect of that. Yeah, well, we talked about in the spec for the compiler and language at some point as well, and like obviously it all ties in together, right? Um, probably end up talking about some of the things that we write in the spec. I don't know if Rightfold's listening, but I know that she wanted to be, or, or has at least been very vocal about wanting a spec. So we're about to see something pop up in the text chat that says, yes, I would love to help out or not. But you've, you've got people in the audience that I think are quite keen to get that stuff done. You just need to make sure she doesn't sneak in dependent types while we're not working. It's too then late. All, then all of a sudden our, like, our language is like lagging behind the spec and we need to implement that stuff. <laughs> so. I thought it was too late. Doesn't 0.12 have, have like type applications and things? It's a slippery slope. It's <laughs> yeah, we're sure I'm completing the type system already, so. <laughs> Are type applications going to be folded in for 0.12? Yeah, I think um, it I mean, proxy types, so, yeah, I mean, it looks like type application, right, in GHC, but um, it is proxy passing still, but it'll be there. That's the plan anyway. And were you saying something in chat earlier about them being polykinded, so you can have, like, all the other different kinds of proxies with that at symbol, like, like the Yeah, they, they are polykinded, yeah. It's not, it's not polykinds in the style of GHC where, like, anything, any data type can be polykinded. It's a built-in... You know, it's like the row list construct, it, it, like the row type constructor is polykinded, right? You can have a row of types or a row of rows of types or whatever. Um, it's like the same sort of thing there where it's built into the compiler so it can be a little bit magic. Um, but yeah, so that's polykinded. You can have like a proxy for a row or a proxy for a string or whatever. That's really cool. 
That's that's all I've got on top of that one. It's awesome that that's getting in there. Yeah, it's it's gonna be really nice. At least until we have like full polycons, which I'm not really I haven't figured out yet exactly how to get that done. But um, it's gonna be at the at the very least it's gonna like hold us over nicely until we get that. Are there any plans for template pure script? So we talked about template pure script uh, ages ago. And the thing that I wanted to see replace template pure script that um, hasn't really happened very much is uh, taking is using like the functional core output and generating uh, generating pure script from it in some form. So um, let's say you have some like library you wanted like a simple example would be like you know uh, a, a printf library or something right you might do that in Haskell with template Haskell. Um, you'd have like a little library of formatters or something and, and one way to do it would be you could compile the functional core output to uh, pure script that like was specific, specifically tailored to that, that format of library, right? Um, that would be one way to do that. Um, and I'd really like to see somebody give that a shot and see if it could work. Because I think it'd be a lot less heavyweight than, uh, uh, you know, full template pure script. I was thinking of something more specifically for like lens, to make lens easier to use. Oh, right. So, so lens is so interesting, right? Because um, with generics and the rollless or like rollcom stuff, we actually don't really need it anymore. But it falls into this interesting category where like we don't need it. But the code we get is slow, so maybe like the functional core thing could be an interesting way to speed it up. Like you don't have to run it through the functional core pass, but you could. And if you did, you could. Kind of do need it for prisms unless you're using variants for all your data types. Well, oh, you like actual data types, you mean? Well, you can use, uh, I mean, there's, um, there's the generics optic or generic lens thing that um, Liam had, right? That's what I mean. Like, we have system features to do it without metaprogramming capabilities, but it's slow because everything goes right inside class dispatch. Um, so, I, I want to see if like functional core rewrites could be a way to avoid that. Like, you know, in template Haskell, you have this sort of phase distinction, right? You have like this. Compile time, like when template Haskell runs, and there's compile time when the compiled template Haskell splices run. In our case, you'd have the phase distinction of you have to run the functional core preprocessor. You have to run it once, do the functional core preprocessor, post processor, sorry, whatever, um, and then run it again through the compiler, like recompile the core, the functional core. So it's a, it's a different approach, but I think it, it I think it's worth looking at. And and then template pure script would basically be like compiler plugins that plug into the, like in between yeah. functional core and code again. Yeah, exactly. Just, yeah, just functions on functional core essentially. Mm -hmm. I mean, to make that like really worth using, I think we'd have to have a type functional core, right? We'd have to have a lint pass on the functional core. But um, I mean, that's something we should just have anyway. Yeah, and, and that would also restrict the template usage to be within like usual pure script syntax, right? Where it needs to parse and type check as actual pure script. What? Well, sorry, what has to type check as actual pure script? Well, if you, if you want to get to functional core, you like the thing you write as the template pure script, like this, like the. The macros basically need to be comprised out of actual pure script syntax. Oh yes, exactly. So it might not be even pure script code that you would actually run at runtime. It might just be pure script code that's sort of like symbolic that stands for what's going to happen inside the expansion phase, you know, on the on the functional core that then gets turned into executable pure script, right? Yeah, and then we'd add like an annotation grammar or something that you can like piece right. to the grammar which tells it tells the compiler to Dispatch certain like pieces of of code to to some plugin like template plugin or something. So it could be that, or it could just be a pure optimization, right? Like I have the slow version, but I can optimize the functional core by running it through this thing. Um, so there's like two options there, and I think both are kind of interesting. But we need to get functional core stuff dusted off, and that that'll be part of point twelve as well, obviously. But it needs somebody to go and tinker with it. I think I think we kind of accidentally answered uh, a larger question I had, which was about code generation and how 
you know, as we're getting more generics and, and especially the roads list stuff in, um, the, the kind of JavaScript that comes out of the end is getting uglier and uglier. But I think that's kind of solved by the idea of having that, that post-processing to say, I mean, as I understand it, it's, it's pretty much flattening the dictionaries, right? You, you specialize for the particular instances. Um, and if that's the case, it solves the problem because then you'd get rid of all that noise by the time it got to JavaScript. But is, is kind of, is clean JavaScript output still something that, that we're looking at as a, as a priority or is that now less important than kind of features? Yeah, so, so for me, I always said like inlining and optimization stuff was gonna be like a post 1.0 feature, like I wasn't really gonna think about it. And so then, but I, um, I do really wanna see it happen. I, the reason I don't want to do it just yet is that it's like sort of a massive problem and like a massive, um, it's like a difficult problem and it's, uh, it, it, there's a lot of options, right? There's, you know, people looking at sort of super compilation in Haskell, that's interesting. Just rewrite rules are interesting, just naive sort of inlining and enabling other like special optimizations, uh, specializations, whatever. Lots of options, right? Um, and. Once we have the functional core stuff, I feel like that sort of opens us up to um, being able to try out a lot of these things uh, outside of the compiler, which I, I want to be able to do. Um, and then once we have evidence that these things are good approaches, then we can bring them back into the compiler possibly, right? Or maybe not, you know, we just keep it separate and it's fine. Um, but I, you know, I do want to see that, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's in the back of my mind that the, the original goal of pure scripts was to have clean JavaScript, and it sort of is if you don't use very many type classes, but we're sort of failing that goal a little bit because we're using them all over the place and encouraging stuff like wrote a list, you know, which is good stuff, but it's sort of at odds with the, the original goals, right? So it's, yeah, it's something that I want to solve at some point. I'm just not sure what the best solution is yet. I've, I've, when people ask me these days, I've kind of backed up from the like saying clean JavaScript, and I've I'm just saying predictable JavaScript now. I know what every construct in the language will generate, and that's kind of like, so if I want the compiler to emit something that looks like a thing, I, like if I want it to emit something that kind of looks like the thing I want, that I know how to do it by using the right structures. Yeah, I think predictable is the right way to describe it. Um, and, and that's the other part of it, right, is that the, uh, the existing optimizer is really, really simple and, and, you know, not very impressive, but it's sort of battle tested. And at this point, like so close to pushing out a 1.0 release, I wouldn't want to sort of try and do some inlining op optimization and end up messing up a lot of uh, code that works really well. Um, it might be slightly slow, but, you know, it, it works. Um, so that, that's another reason why I want to sort of think about it after 1.0. Yeah, does anyone have anything else they want to share? Or, um, I mean, I can keep asking Phil questions all evening. But... I just want to say that my home run Ball library is pretty cool, and people should check it out sometime. Is it about what? baseball? <laughs> no, it's, uh, about... it's it's about a Korean snack food called home run ball. <laughs> now but it's mean, actually validations, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, so the idea is that like you want you have like a row of uh, validations that you're going to perform. And like you can write the instances for how to do those validations, and it runs it in a validation like the V. So on the left side, you get a non-empty list of variants of those uh, labels of the rules that have failed, and then on the right side, you get the a const string. So you get your string, but then you also get like the type level information about what validations have been performed. So you can write a bunch of functions that just operate with a sub. Uh, with a uh, subset of the rules started and whatnot. So, I don't know. I think it's like really fun because it's everything I've wanted from validation libraries like ever. And so like, it's cool that we can do that with road types. But 
Yeah, um, I, I posted go. on like the subreddit and stuff, so. Uh, go ahead. I'm not, yeah, I was looking through that code and it, it looks so foreign to me. Like the idea of putting validation in like this type level thing. But I like, I'm, I'm not like, I'm scared to use it because it looks like too experimental. <laughs> and no, it's so it's like right now, like for validation, what I do is like I write a function called like, uh, it has upper, like starts with uppercase, right? And then like another function has a different rule and then you can use like some combinators to put them together, right? Some, some, some sort of validation composition. Like one big, one big, val big, big validator. Um, whereas in, in your home run ball, um, it's like, why not just do the, do the, the way that we're already doing, which is like writing multiple validation functions and then composing together the big one. Like, why not do that? Like, what, what, what don't you like about doing that? That makes you want to do this other way. I mean, so I think you do that, but then it's a superset because you want to, I, I also want to know like what values I have in like my logical chain, like what kind of validation I've done, because I, then I can actually write functions that say like, okay, only this function should only be able to be used if like this co code path has validated that this exists, right? So like my simple stupid case is that I have like a tracker full of like anime downloads and I want to make sure that like the video quality is like 720p and then it's by like a certain subbing group. So my library can like do that. Do, I can do the validation. And then at the tech level, I have the row validations that say like, okay, it's been checked for being by this group and it's been checked by for being like 720p. So now I can like actually run this function. So it's like the same idea, except I just want more metadata. So you, you that makes some sense. Like, you want to do like a constraint, like a type level type class constraint? So if you have a, um, so for like, for example, if you're doing like a database, like inserting a record into a, into a database, you want to do some constraint that the user's first name starts with the uppercase character. So like you can do like a type class constraint to, you know, prove this. Yeah, well, but in this case, it's just a, uh, it's a field that exists in a row. So it's, it's like name starts with capital, a colon, colon, like, uh, first letter capital or capitalized. Huh. Yeah, um, I could go over it some other meetup sometime, I guess. Interesting. But uh, for now, I'll just link my thing. I think I'll take a, I kind of want to take a closer look now. Thank yeah, thanks for. Yeah, thanks. I think coming coming back to what you were saying, Justin, about um writing functions that will only take values that have passed certain validation, I think is where I kind of looked at it and thought, oh, wow, this is amazing. Um, and more because as a not particularly good programmer and a not particularly conscious, lucid human being, it's nice that the compiler will say, you've missed a step, right? You, you can write something, say, um, I don't know, my view function takes some escaped uh, text and prints it. I can have a type level constraint that says, this text has been escaped, right? There's, there's no cross-site scripting going on. I have this, this type level assertion that that point has passed. Whereas if I have that at value level, there's, there's no compiler check, right? I have the usual stuff about type errors, but, but now there's an actual compiler warning that says you, you're putting a bug into your code. And, that's the thing I think is really cool about this concept. Yeah, and I realized that like the way I should be explaining it is that this like the row of validations that like you have is basically isomorphic to an, a new type where the constructor is hidden, right? But then yeah, because it's row types, you can put them in all kinds of unordered ways, and it's like super fun. Or maybe it's esoteric, but I think it's mostly fun. I love seeing the uh, the cool ways people use row types. It's sort of this thing that, like, you know, Haskell doesn't have, and they emulate it in various ways. And it's like one of the only places where you can sort of like really do stuff, you know, 
experimental stuff that we can't do in our school. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> the, one, uh, the one I tried, which I thought was really fun, was um, using row list for, um, uh, what do you call it, units of measure. Uh, so you, you, you know, you have like, a, your row is your, uh, uh, your dimensions, right? And then, uh, because I don't care, you know, if I multiply meters and seconds, I, I don't care if that's meters times seconds or seconds times meters, so it's naturally unordered. But um, I can have, like, and duplicate labels means I can have, like, meters squared or something, right? Um, and then, you know, multiplication and all these things are just operations on rows, which we can use row to list. So there's all these nice things that, uh, where, like, you know, type level maps are just a nice fit, and you can, you know, experiment with all these cool things. So I love to see, yeah. I love to see these things. One thing that got me unreasonably excited is variance, um, because of how it, like you don't need these huge types modules for some of the things. Like you don't need to have that giant sum with all the injections that's defined somewhere that everything depends on. But instead, you can kind of modularize it. Like everything, like it's extensible in the sense that you get to define. Yeah, I want to add another possible error to my huge sum of errors in my huge. Um, but I can keep that like local to the module where the error occurs, and I can write like the because the, the like the error message is kind of contextual to that module, um, and then I can because variants are yeah like, kind of extensible in a sense. I I can collect all the errors that I have in my application in the compiler, make sure that I handle everyone, but I can distribute the handlers into the modules that are, like where they belong. And that's great for compile times, and that's great just for general architecture because it allows to keep the code more module, I think. Yeah, variants are really nice. The other one uh, that sort of blew me away was uh, pure script run. So that's like, you know, that's, that's like, you know, one level up, right? Like sums like variants, but one level up, and, and then taking like free one out over that. And it's like, we had injects before that, and it was a mess. And you have a lot of data type color cards and without instance chains, it's kind of a mess, but like it all just falls together really nicely with rows. And I think they, they did an awesome job with that. Yeah, inf inference is just so good when it's because rows are just unification. So like inference is just yeah. great. I think it's, it's going to be fun to see more really concrete, practical examples come up like business use examples the 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 thing that's kind of been playing in my mind is is about things like permissions using row types to say i am a user and and this is this is what i'm capable of doing and then you can use row to list stuff essentially for verification you can say like the the thing you want to do requires permission a b and c but we can't see that you've got permission c and then again, it's, it's like compile time assurance that, that these things can't happen, that you can't have those security issues because you've said that this thing requires this permission and you said that the user has this capability. So I think it's just, it's really cool to, to think about the, the really concrete practical ideas using this concept because I think, yeah, I think it's, it's nowhere near as explored as it could be. And I think it'd be really cool to see those kind of ideas come up and seeing a, yeah justin's just written it acl as a as a library as a row type library i think would be a really cool idea you know um or like a plug-in system you know when you when you install something on an android phone and it's like this thing wants to use your camera and your location and like these are all fields in in like a row type and uh i i just yeah i think there are a lot of of very very practical very business case examples that that we're still missing but i know are there and would be again would be exciting for newcomers to see and to to realize that you know oh wow i've got compile time security checks i mean it's just pretty cool yeah i think i mean when you just talked about camera and and like like microphone or something i think we kind of have that with f with the row like yeah. in f but I think the one thing that's that's missing and that you kind of need is a lot of the times when you check that the permission exists or like that something is valid, you you don't only like get the label that yeah this is valid or something. You also get like a token or something back which proves that you have that permission and you kind of need 
like some way of carrying that around with you to make that useful. Um, because like if I if I've checked the string for a certain for certain qualities, I kind of then also want to have the functions that exploit these qualities without like having maybes again because I just checked that without needing unsafe course basically. Phil's done something clever in the chat. So I was thinking what you could do is have like a row of permissions as like a row of type level strings or something, right? And then uh, you could just use f like regular f to say you know I have some permission uh, effect, right? And the effect is parameterized on. Um, Oh, I got that kind of wrong. There should be an effect in there. But the effect is parameterized on the row, right? And then, uh, so a reify permission would be like, give me a type level string that's the permission you want, the proxy for it, right? So I can say like admin or something. And it will bring in the scope of row cons constraint that say uh, locally you have admin permissions. Right? And then all your functions are just you know, F actions where, you know, my my uh, actions have, you know, re require a row cons constraint. But at the top level, I can just bring this collection of row comes constraints into uh, into you know into scope um, and give it a type signature with all the you know things that I expect. Whether that play nicely with um, you know actual concrete rows, I'm not sure. You probably figure it out. Some some nice way to make that work, but like, that would be nice if that worked. All right, well, I have nothing else. And if uh, nobody has any other questions, I actually need to get going pretty soon. So I'm going to sign off. Later, Phil. Thanks for coming. Well, have a good great weekend. talking to you, Phil. You too. Oh, yeah. Good meeting. Good to see you all. Um, yeah, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Um, yeah. I was actually curious is there, is there some Ocala user in here? Because I want to steal Merlin's uh, ideas. I want to steal everything that Merlin does and do it better. This is Merlin who? Merlin is the, yeah, the editor integration for a camel. It's pretty good, actually. Like, it's pretty amazing. Um, oh. I kind of want to steal everything. So I was just curious what, like, what people really enjoy about Merlin because I think it has like type directed auto completion, which is kind of what I'm shooting for at some point. Oh does it? Yep. I've it's kind of making me jealous. That That's magic. That is. Do you ever see was it the Unison demo? They had like their concept of a text editor where you would you would start typing and it would tell you before you finished typing that what you were going to type would be an error. It'd be like we're writing a string and the syntax is wrong, which we kind of all understand, but it's like you've you've used this lift function and the thing in second position doesn't match with the thing you're trying to type. Like we've used type directed search and everything you could possibly put here would cause an error and therefore you're already wrong. Like it's properly magic. But that's kind of yeah, that's cool unless you have infix operators, in which case you can write things. <laughs> the wrong way around, and then that all breaks down. Which is a little sad. Like the the whole, I think the whole auto like type directed auto completion only works with the forward type operator. So. <laughs> cool. Well, um, if no one has anything else to demo, I am going to go to bed. Right. Yeah. Thanks for stopping by, Tom. <laughs> No, uh, uh, thank you, everyone else. It's it's like I've I've been to a couple of them before, but not said anything, and now I feel like I've said too much. So hopefully, on average, it's no, yeah, it was fun. It's great. Cool. Yeah, we need more people to say things than me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and right, you did a very good job restraining yourself today. <laughs> <laughs> no, I kid, I kid. <laughs> Alex, do you have any any plans for? Other type classes. I, I don't know where you are in your in your kind of series. What what are you going to be doing next, oh, dude? I'm thinking about giving up. Like I can't handle this. It's it's such a big responsibility, because like I have such high expectations for like what I want it to be, but I'm nowhere near the skill level to be able to do this stuff. So like I like I was able to do like semi group and monoid, but 
like to like a basic extent. But like now, now, now I think about like I, I hear other people talk about monoid, and it's like the basis of category theory, and it's like, oh really? Hmm, maybe I missed some stuff on monoid. But then like, okay, that's okay. I mean, monoid's still like super useful. Just thinking of like a way you can smush things together. But it's not really doing like the monoid concept. Like, there's a whole field around around like monoids. It's like, yeah, yeah. So like, like, like whatever I say about monoids is gonna be. It's not just like a tip of the iceberg, but it's like not even saying that there's an iceberg out there. And like that's the same thing with like category. And like there's a few other things in the prelude which I could probably like just skip the category thing and just, just do some other stuff. But um Although there there is a distinction between uh like what a, even what a monad is in category theory versus what it is in like how square pure script. Like it's just an interface. And like they're not the same, they're really not the same thing. No, but you see, that's the exact attitude, which I think is like wrong to have. It's just an interface. It's like, no, no, no. Like, like no, like people, like th this is like type classes here for a reason. It's not just like there's a type class for associativity so that like you say some, it's like properties of things. And then like, like there's different ways of doing this type class stuff, but. I think it's way deeper than just saying it's an interface and like even like saying it's an interface is like, well, well really I mean, there's people's understanding of what like, well, it, it's the same kind of thing where, where you'll, you'll explain to someone what a functor is. Like you, some people will say, well, technically it's not true that it's like a box that you can put something in, but like you have to start somewhere to explain it to somebody. Yeah. Also, I don't, I don't think it's harmful to newcomers to see someone who writes pure scripts say, I really don't see what category gives me beyond functions, right? Because that says to a big beginner, that's not something I have to get to be productive in this language. I can just kind of read semi-groupoid as, okay, it's function composition, ignore it, I'll come back to it later. Like, I think we have a huge problem in, in functional programming as a whole that we're really afraid to say we don't know something or we've never needed to know something. And I, I actually think it's quite helpful to have these conversations where we kind of, we sit down and go, yeah, you could do this stuff, but I've, I've never tried it. I've, you know, I've never actually done it because then that says I've never actually needed it. And I don't know, that sounds like a good thing. And also when you, when you say that, like there's this whole deep thing like that, that you're not doing, like when you're talking about monoid that you're not doing justice to, like monoid in itself is really simple. The deep, the deepness or the wealth of applications is actually when it interacts with different other things. Like, and that's often, like the problem is that if you just explain the monoid thing on its own, it's not really, it's not really useful in and of itself. It's kind of when you see all the instances that it makes sense or how it interacts with applicative and how it's like there's the alternative type class, which is kind of like monoid, just lifted to alternative and how monoids interact when you say, yeah, I can parallelize these things because they, because they are like associative and I can, and that's when all of the, like the applications and interactions with other abstractions come into play. Hmm. It's like when you, I think at least this sort of applies here. Like when you teach someone about, about mechanics, about physics, like how, uh, how to calculate where a ball is going to be when it's thrown at a certain point in time. Like you don't start by teaching them the theory of relativity. Like you start with Newton's like Newtonian mechanics, even though it's technically not right. It's a simplification of it that actually works in certain constraints. And they may never need, like, if they're only calculating, like, um, like calculating for projectiles, like the military did when they, um, when computers first started becoming popular for doing things like that. Um, like, you don't, you don't need relativity for that. You just need Newton's physics. Hmm, that's pretty interesting. Because um, I was originally thinking that. Um... Because right, like there's no, there's no good like what I wanted to do with this series was to explain like this, like the science behind it, or like introduce the science behind it, so that um, 
you know, you have an idea that there is science behind it. <laughs> and it's not just like arbitrary words that people pulled out. Um, um, yeah, right. I, th I think the problem there is that you can't just, just say, so I'm going to give you a lecture on, on monoids now, and you can, f and I can fill a lecture on monoids because all the interesting stuff requires that you've talked about other things beforehand, or because the connections with other things are the fun stuff. So mm -hmm. you kind of, you, st you explain monoid as this really simple thing, and then you also explain a applicative, which on its own is also this really like simple thing with just three functions and three laws or something. But if you put them together, oh no, now I have another thing. And the way these things interact is where like the really fun parts come up. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, like some, so like start, starting from the simple thing, like the simple thing is like the interface point of view, right? Um, but then like the truly inspiring thing, uh, inspiring part is seeing that the inter like the interface comes from um, like some mathematical uh, uh, concepts, like some mathematical disciplines, um, and being able to explain like how like the interface uh, is coming from some of these mathematical concepts is uh, is where I see the value is. The, the thing is that these interfaces, most of the time in mathematics, are also just definitions. Like they also conjured up from thin air. And then, but mm -hmm. th no, that's wrong. They're not conjured up. They, they, yeah, they're definitions, but they have been defined in the way they are because you can do all these interesting things with them. So there was this whole bunch of interesting stuff that you could do and they condensed it down to the simplest formulation that you could use to do all the things you wanted to do with it. Mm -hmm. But that's like two different fields though. Like if you, if you want to talk about like purity and like then you talk about mathematics, but like, like you, you could say that same kind of thing about programmers too. So like if programmers don't know about mathematics and they just make up their own concepts to describe to, uh, for how to solve problems. And that's like everywhere, like, the, like every other program. But yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, I'm, yeah, but. Are you, are you referring to OOP? Yes, yes. It's like OOP works too. <laughs> People do stuff with OOP. But uh, yeah. Yeah, the thing about these mathematic definitions is they have very rigorous structure and they are defined in this very minimal way because then you can actually prove things about them. And yeah, they are like entirely and fully described. There's no wiggle room in there. It's kind of the thing. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yes. Yes. Yeah. Maybe, maybe next time I could talk about something more. Uh, like. Yeah. Okay. I get it. Yeah. So I, I, you think it's okay to just stick with like the interface point of view for like describing some of these type um, type classes? I think so. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Because that that's 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 what what they are on their own, and mm -hmm. and then yeah, the fun stuff is saying yeah, with this simple definition, we can now like that automatically entails that we can now do, like that there are these bunch of functions that we can now define because we have this. Like you start with monoid and it only puts together like an A and an A and gives you back an A. But that also means now that every structure that I can fold, that's the, like, that I can also collapse that down into an A. Is foldable, does that, like, does that come from like some mathematical discipline? <laughs> Some no, sort of, like the study of foldable objects. No, <laughs> is, it, is there a course in college? No, <laughs> foldable. That, that's why the why some people in the Ascal community are not very happy about foldable, primarily <laughs> an optimization kind of thing. Um, but it interacts with traverse. Like traversable is a very, very, very useful and thing that comes up all the time and everywhere. And you kind of need foldable to describe traversable. So. And it's, it's traversable. That, that's not. That's also not like a mathematical field. Like peer study. It's foldable and applicative. So applicative is the part that is very principled and like well known. Uh -huh. The foldable part, not so much, but we do that all the time. So that's why why traversal is so important. I think one one of the other uh, potential obstacles is that in PeerScript there are so many more type classes than, for example, 
Haskell, there's like a few main type classes you can just learn and it's like, okay, I know these. But in PureScript, it's like, you don't just have Monad, you have, the, is, it, is it called bind in Monad? And then for applicative, it's apply in applicative. And there's all these- Yeah, Monad is the thing that carries the laws. It has no members in of its own. Bind is in like the bind type class, like the bind function, because you can, um, you can rebind the bind thing, I think is kind of the, the idea because we have do like rebindable syntax for do. So if you want to do like a non-lawful bind instance, because that gives you like a cool DSL and you can do that without having to have used Monad, which is like needs a pure. That seems pretty arbitrary to me. I'm, I'm not quite convinced on like how that's a reasonable separation of bind type class separate from the monad type class. So the, the, the bind type class just says like some thing has, you can use bind on it. Exactly, yeah, and then monad says, yeah, so, you need bind and applicative because applicative entails pure and map. What do you think about having like a mappable type class then? <laughs> Why is that? I've heard, of, I've heard of that too, and it's like a mapable type class. Okay, that means like this object, ha you can use a map function on it. <laughs> It's like this yeah, I mean, we've, we've got a functor for that. We don't need, there's no special syntax for functor, so there's no point in having it separate. Mm -hmm. uh, some, something I just thought of that someone was talking about, uh, I think it was like a few days ago or last week in the Haskell channel, they brought up the definition of monad, the one that's used in memes all the time. like. A monad is just a, a monoid in the or a monad is just a monoid in the category of endo functors, and then it's like, well, you look at the definition of monad, and it doesn't depend on monoid at all. First of all, <laughs> so it's like, well, the definition might make sense in category theory, but it does make does not make any sense in Haskell or pure script. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, like, so the, the thing about bind being on its own, that's, that's kind of the same thing. Like bind on its own is just the definition of the interface and it doesn't, doesn't carry any more meaning. But as soon as you call it a monad and you put together applicative and bind, that's where you get the laws that it needs to satisfy in combination with applicative to have like an actual monad. And that's where the rigorous structure comes in. Bind on its own is just, it's just a name, like a definition for a thing. Uh-huh. So the, like the monad type class, um, it's just being a responsible developer to make sure that your instance of the monad um, is lawful. Like, well, it like behaves like a monad and by be behaving like a monad, it follows those laws. Well, the, the laws are part of the interface. Like if I write a function that operates on monad, I can assume that I can do these rewritings because um, like if your code breaks because you you've written like a not lawful monad instance, that's yeah. your problem. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's an interesting. I never thought about that. So like one of the like one of the side effects, the benefits of having uh, lawful instances is that they're predictable rewrites. Because like yeah, that's like I think the rewrites thing is like a really interesting thing because that that that's like uh, like functional purity. Uh, so you can like rewrite one expression in a simpler or more complex way, like the algebra. Yeah, right, exactly. And I mean, you can kind of... So the laws let you do that. We don't have the machinery in PureScript to do that, but um, I mean, there are, there are definitions where I'm Huh. I'm not sure how to say that yet, but mm -hmm. the laws are part of the interface of the type class. And if I'm writing a function that uses that, like has a constraint on that type class, I can feel free to use the, the laws that are implied for that type class. Like, and then I'm a good pure script developer, basically. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 yeah, it's hard to describe. So like so, so some of these like mathematical things, like like this type class has to have laws. But then that question people ask is like, why does that have to have laws? And it's not always easy for me to like have an answer for that. So yeah, I think that's like a good way to, uh, an interesting way to consider looking at it is like, well, if you have laws, then you can do rewrites. And rewrites is what you want, right? That's interesting. Yeah, and also the laws are what makes it like what, again, it's about the rigorous structure and how things interact with one another. And the laws govern how certain things interact with one another because that leads to predictable and like intuitive behavior in, as a user of an API. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I should so the que there's a like, question. So what do I do for ad hoc polymorphism or something that has no laws? You use a type class and you say there, there are no laws for this thing. <laughs> what, what, I, what I was saying is that, so that, yeah, some people don't like that, but Phil said it in a nice way. If a type checks, it's pure script and for you make laws <laughs> of the type. Like, <clears throat> so, I mean, Justin uses type classes like we use functions because he did, because he does all kinds of crazy type level programming stuff. There, there's nothing lawful about that. It's probably unlawful. Uh, the only law is that you have to have fun. <laughs> there you go. Right, so you need you need whenever you conjure up like one of those rollist monsters, you need to diab diabolic laughter during implementation. That's primary. That's really interesting. Like I, I always kind of uh, like, like at least in the prelude, like a lot of standard libraries, like the F, like the harder modules, the harder type classes, like the monad and the applicative, like they have these laws, right? So then I thought, like, okay, every type class it's got to like have some laws, like all my data structures. Well, that that's not entirely necessary. If if you do, it's it's useful, but. Yeah, there's different uses for it. For example, there's like this finally tagless style where you do things with type classes to like um, compose like different, uh, sorry, that was rambling. Uh, but type classes appear in some patterns where you define if, like a bunch, bunch of type classes. Um, but like the general kind of, the most, like the general experience that I had is whenever I wrote a type class, I would have better just passed around functions because like the stuff that I come up with is does not have enough structure and then I just end up uh, uh, shooting myself in the foot, I feel. Yeah, sorry, can you say it again? For, for example, one, one example is show uh -huh. one of these type classes. Yeah. Right. It's horrible. <laughs> Show calls all kinds of trouble to me, at least. Yeah. Like it's, it's annoying, inference is bad around it, and like most of the time, a pretty printer should take some options because there's not like one way to print a certain data type. And because people derive the show instance, they're like, yeah, you can convert it into a string, that's fine. But no, there's like, usually there's a better way to print something to a string, but that requires some, some settings or options, like a number format or something. And the same thing is with um, with the JSON decoding. I really dislike by now the like type classy version of decoding JSON because again it has led to all kinds of problems and bugs that I didn't like. Uh, and the inference oh, around this. Are you talking about uh, Justin simple JSON? No, that's a different thing. That's that's fine. Okay. That's going directly from that. That that's not the thing. Is that I, I like the, for example, have you used the Afjx library yet? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's like this respondable type class, which is <laughs> yeah, oh, right, boy. right, uh -huh. which is like de trying to decode the body of your res of your response, but then that breaks down as soon as you have like different types of bodies for. Um, 
for the success and the error case and people only test with their success cases and then all of a sudden they get horrible like runtime exceptions or or st not, not not runtime exceptions but like errors that they didn't expect to happen in production because they get error codes back from the api or something and then there's like no content in there and the library tried to decode it as something and so what ends up happening is that the only thing you should use from that responsible thing is like always say it's a foreign and then do the manual decoding from there. Uh -huh. So like this implicit behavior is causing, causes a lot of trouble and just the inference around it is poor and I generally don't like it. That's really interesting. Uh, the show type class, would you say that that's like uh, the ad hoc po polymorphism? It's like uh... Ad hoc polymorphism in general refers to um, to things that are like like that's a, like the, this, a certain type of polymorphism that depends on like, like different from overloading. Yeah, Pretty basically that. Yeah, like the type that like some type determines how a certain function behaves. Like parametric polymorphism says that your function needs to be needs to happen uniformly for whatever type you give it. Like you're not allowed to inspect the type. And ad hoc polymorphism does the exact is the thing where it inspects the type and chooses what to do depending on what type you passed in. Oh, that sounds like variance. Uh, no, 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 no. It, the, I mean, More like patterns. Generics. Say again, patterns? Right, parametric polymorphism, parametric polymorphism is more like generics in other languages. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, did I say parametric polymorphism or did I say ad hoc polymorphism? You asked about ad hoc, but then yeah. somehow we got to talking about parametric. Because it's it's easier to describe, I think, ad hoc polymorphism in like in opposition to parametric polymorphism. Yeah. 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 Exactly. In, over in objective or in the programming, ad hoc ad hoc polymorphism is like interfaces. Yeah. I actually don't know though. How do I do like multi-parameter type classes in Java? That sounds, it's a troll question, but can someone link me to an article? In Java? <laughs> yes. No. Multi-parameter type classes are not even in Haskell 98. They are kind of tricky because they actually descend into prolog really quickly. Ah, oh, okay. But yeah, I try to not use type class. Like, 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 I've got a coworker who's like, let's just use a type class for it to like solve problems for a function. Like, oh, here's a function. I want to take a type, specific type. But then, like, well, actually, it'd be nice to make it accept multiple types. So let's just use a type class for it. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Type classes. I'd like to save those for special times. Some people go crazy no. type classes. Yeah, they are wonderful, and they maximize <laughs> fun. <laughs> it's like you get to uh, lift a case statement that would normally be in the value level up to the type level. So yeah, that's the type that's programming version with fun devs, but that's a different use of type class, I think. <laughs> yeah, that's a different use. And the fun devs are called fun devs because you have fun with them. <laughs> the Thunders. amount of fun you have depends on how much, how much fun devs you have. <laughs> Yeah, there's like, there's like a bunch of these and that all of the Haskell pretty printer libraries have like this, like pretty type class or something where you, which is again, like this kind of annoying type class in a sense. And I think these things turn out like a lot nicer if you do, um, if you just re like re in the signature of the function, request the f function that does what you want, like, if you want uh, just like explicit dictionary passing. And I think that works especially well in Pyotr because you actually have first class records. So it's easy to pass like a collection of functions. Isn't that what it, 
what it eventually turns into, though? Yeah, at runtime it does. I just want it to be done automatically. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is that when you do it in your own code, it's still only is unification, so you don't like you don't get into like the the implicit compiler infers something and just fills that like hole out for you, which is kind of convenient at first, but then it kind of bites you because all of a sudden your decoding breaks or something. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice to have like uh, like a, a simple rule that you can kind of remember, so that you know, like when type classes are can cause problems. The rule is there. Because like, no... like like the show type class, it like it kind of causes problems because you think the wrong way about what it should about when you should be using it, and like the yeah. requestable type class. Like, eh. But we still do need show. Like show, I'd rather have it called debug, yeah, and have the compiler do some special magic around it, but. We do need it. I think. I think the golden rule is so, that so, there so, so, are no golden rules. And, uh, yeah. And no well, rules you, you either. Can use type classes to do what, to do whatever you want, but you'll regret using it if you use it in, to solve certain problems. I think yeah. Just have to overuse them once, be bitten by them, and then <laughs> you can kind of. Yeah. If, if they burn you once, you can kind of get a better feeling for when they, when they're good. Yeah, I, I like to have a rule book, <laughs> but it's not, it's not, that's not, not always the right answer. And, and a lot of the time, actually, when it seems like you want a type class, that's not actually what happens, like what ends up working out. Um, there was this great blog post, which I'm searching ever since I've, I like, I've read it once and it was cool, but I can't find it anymore. <laughs> Where someone was like, um, he wanted, he had like a program and he wanted the, like he had like a core program and he wanted it to be able to be extended by someone else. And so he was like, Oh, so someone should be able to do something with their own data types. That sounds like a type class. And then he showed how that not didn't, didn't work out at all. And it was actually like passing, like what you needed to do was uh, passing around functions and using existentials. Uh, that was really cool. That blog post, but I can't find it anymore. Oh boy, existentials. Another void in my knowledge. So is, is there anything in particular that, that you'll do if you're, like if you're trying to show someone that's never written anything like PureScript or any ML family language at all, um, you're trying to introduce it to them and they get to the REPL and then they, like they're used to a REPL working in a certain way where it'll, like in JavaScript, it'll just, it'll print out what the, what the result is. Um, if you, you define something and then you want to see what it is, it'll print it out. But in PureScript, instead you get this error. Like we, I, it says, we don't know how to show this. So then you have to, like, you have to introduce them to like, oh, first define a generic uh, instance of this. And then you can define a show instance of this. And it says show equal to G show. And it just seems <laughs> like, no, unsafe course. <laughs> well, one thing you can always, you can do is use the trace any or something because JavaScript already has a way of showing values, like primitive values, pretty good. Like the, you can just trace it out in a sense, like forego, forego the two string conversion at least. That's what I like to use. That's pretty interesting. And Haskell? There's like tr trace any or spy. Both of, the, both of these just work. And then soon we have show instance for records. So uh, that's gonna, not going to be a problem anymore because Justin is going to implement that. <laughs> <laughs> I have a demo, but like, yeah, it needs the actual instance. It, like, we need to unify the pure script record and like prelude stuff already. Oh, the library, PureScript record? Yeah. And also, like, I use unsafe string of pi all the time because, yeah, YOLO. Yeah, yeah, the last episode of Magic Read Along, they're talking about pretty printers. Pretty interesting topic. Is that something you're interested in, Chris Greek? 
Sure. I still want the formatter. That was actually the pretty printer stuff is I don't think that's the problem really. Um like pretty printing is basically just concatenating strings. Um the interesting part is how to get like a a good AST of source code that you can use to um to like that actually preserves all of the structure that you had in the source file when you parsed it. Because what the compiler cares about for compilation is not what you care about for doing layouts. And there was a really cool blog post about that, um, about the Dart formatter that they wrote, like Dart uh, source like code formatter, and how they used um, an AST, which ah, I'll find that one in a second, uh, an AST, which the nodes in that AST were the blocks in the code that did not allow line breaks in between. And then they use use that AST basically to to lay these things out so that they fit in the line or something. I think that's the, the more interesting part is that you need to think of a structure, uh, like think of an AST that captures what layout you need, like the information you need to do layouting in your source code. So you, like there's like a type class. Uh... Uh, like the compiler would solve like a type class constraint called like oh, no, no, no. The, the type class part of, of pretty printing is just that there's like a function which goes from some a to document which is like this abstract thingy which in the end turns out to be a string um and then you define that like thing that like my type goes to document function which is like just like show which is my my type goes to show, but when my type goes to document, like that abstract type has a height and a width, which you can use to lay things out. Like that's what the pretty printer algorithm does, but like that type class is kind of, it's the same as show. It, it's just one function which goes from some A to some type, like some op opaque type kind of. So it's just there for convenience so that you can use the same name over and over again. Yeah. That's really a super uh, interesting concept. I didn't think about that. So like that, that AST thing? Uh, I found it, I found the blog post. This is, I'd recommend reading the it. hardest program ever written. It's pretty fucking good, yeah. <laughs> That AST thing, uh, would that be done in the uh, compiler? Is that what you're talking about? No. Nah. That's the only place I've ever seen ASTs. It needs to be done, like the format, if we want to have pure script format, which is like M format, right? Code formatter, source code formatter, then we'd need, that thing would need to have an AST. Oh, that would be separate from like code yeah. compilation. That what, what I was saying is that the, like, that the compiler's AST is not suited to be used as the foundation for pretty printing source code. Mm. And because the compiler cares about how like declarations and expressions are nested and stuff. But what you care about when you want to do pretty printing is are all elements in this array on the same line? That's like a Thing that the compiler doesn't care about, it just cares that there's like an array of expression. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, anyway, I think uh, I'm going to go back to implementing record completions in Emacs. Oh, are you still working on that? Yeah, I've picked it back up. Still works. Just want to make it like a little more robust and then I'm happy with it. And I'll let people use it. You had that, it looked like you had it mostly working a few months ago. Yeah. I had it working for the demo case, but not. <laughs> not universally. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a bit tricky because you kind of need to, you need to parse backwards. Is that mostly Elis stuff that you? Yeah, it is. I've tried to do it in Haskell, but it ends up being the same as the code in Elis, kind of. Um, yeah. 
So if you want, want to have record completion in uh, Vim or Atom, we'd have to write some. Yeah. Um, you you'd need the plugins would need to add code anyway because the completion in PSCIDE does not work by the editors telling telling PSCIDE I'm at like line twenty and colon eighteen. What are the completions right here? But instead, like PCID is more like a database that you can send queries to. Right. And so for the record completion, you can need to do some parsing to determine which, like what part of the buffer is the expression that you're trying to pull a field off. You need to wrap that in parentheses, apply a type hole to it, extract the information from the compiler, uh, and that's the, like the, the process that you have to go through. Oh, so it's like a two, it's a two query solution. Uh, it, it, well, you take, take, take the expression and apply a type tool and then you get back the type response. And then right. You and that's the, the, no, the type response has all the information you need to provide the completion, but you can't query the query, com like PCI is a database for that, but you need to run the like rebuild because you need the compiler error rather than like some filtered down set of identifiers that your project has. Right, because there's no database of all the record fields or something that you could have in a program in PSCID because that would be all the strings. Um, okay, yeah, I think that's right. There's no declarations for the record. Like, you can have, you can create like ad hoc records on the fly. You don't need to declare a type for them anywhere. Mm -hmm. Right, I can just, I can just make it literally like a record literal. I can just say yeah, x is one and y is hello or something. And then if you hit dot after that, you should be able to pick off x and y as the fields. But there was no declaration anywhere of that thing. Oh, so like like there's no like data x equals this structure. Yeah, exactly. Because or type x equals that thing. Like just a find yeah. record anywhere. Right. Without a name, unnamed. Yeah, and you, I mean, you could have like an X which has a type that you know of that is like declared somewhere, but then you apply one of the functions from PS record which picks off fields or adds new fields or something to it, and now you've got a completely new type that you've not seen in the project, like in the project before. So that's why, like the, the previous way of getting completions doesn't work for that case. It's like a different process that you need to go through. Also, yeah, it's that, that, slower that's because you know. records because records is like a, a primitive in like the language, right? Yeah, exactly. Because I think OCaml has like the polymorphic variants and yeah, well, if, variants, if like variants are sums. Records are you, right. Records are products. Variants are sums. They are like the opposite thing of one another. I have a good one. Right, 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 right. But like a polymorphic, polymorphic variant, it doesn't have like a, uh, a name for that type. Like, you know, it'll, oh, yeah. it'll, it'll, it'll just infer like mm -hmm. a, a, a polymorphic variant for you. Yeah. So, yeah. So then if, like, if you want to know like what fields are, are, like what options are on that polymorphic variant, like you can't just ask compiler here's like, because it doesn't have a name. You, 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 you can't ask compiler for like, Yeah, the, there's no database which holds that information. The compiler does create that information during inference. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But you need to run through the whole compilation process to get to that point, basically. Or at least through type checking. Mm -hmm. So that's how that goes. Yeah. So yeah and that's why that's a little tricky because. Yeah, I need to do the expression like figure out what the previous expression is in ELISP, kind of. Because, yeah, you need to parse backwards <laughs> and you need to think of all the rules that there are in PureScript because there is no backwards parser in the compiler, but you hit the dot and then you need to parse the thing in front of the dot, but you don't know where to start and you don't want to start from the top of the file. Yeah. So you need to parse So right, right now in PSCID server, the, the, like there's no way you can do a query like, uh... Uh, this symbol um, at this position, and just tell me the type of it. You can't do no. that in CID server, right? No. Is, is that because there's no source bands in the in the AST right now? No, that's just because there is no um, because that's a very brittle way of completing things. 
kind of. Well, I mean, you you want to ask like, what's the type of this thing? So you you need to specify which which thing you're you're you're, you're asking for, right? If you ask PCID, give me the type of the thing at this point. Yeah. That would run the compiler's parser on it. That would mean PCID only works when your file is syntactically valid. Oh. Which is pretty poor behavior in, in an editor. Oh, I see. Right. So what the editor instead does is it says, is what you can ask PCID here? to do, the one thing you can ask PCID to do is only parse the module header. like. As long as you don't have syntax errors in your imports, it'll give you back like all the imports and all the qualifications and stuff. So that like can parse that bit. But like parsing the entire module is usually is not very useful in an editor setting. Well it is, but you always need a fallback to be able to say, if the parsing fails, then I want to just search for the string or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, PCID is pretty good. Like, it allows the editors to filter that down pretty well without needing the parsing, which also makes it really fast in a sense because parsing is kind of a slow process. Yeah, I forget that you only parse it just that once and you keep it all in that database and then you're sending queries to it. I forgot about that. Yeah, and I'm not building that database from, from parsing source files as well. I'm building that database from the compiler output, from the stuff the compiler has output into your output directory. Oh, oh, like that X trans file business. Yeah, exactly. And then, I mean, I still parse the source files and combine the information from there because there is some information that the compiler loses during the compilation process. Um, hmm. Well, it doesn't lose it, but it's just not relevant to the compiler. It's relevant to me as an IDE guy, but. Yeah, Could, well, I wonder at some point, because there's that, uh, you can spit out from the compiler. Well, you still have to do the full compiler process, like like the, that, like that mid, middle middle representation, mm -hmm. uh, dump, dump core fun. Yeah. And, and then you can do, so, like this talk about improving that uh, representation. I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Struggles with lack of information there. Yeah, that's kind of be right before code gen, but that means that all the semantic analysis has already happened. Like right. Parsing, yeah. parsing happened, desugaring happened, type checking happened. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, but but okay. So like the PSE ID, it loads all those uh, extrins files to get some database, and then it does some. So you get some information from the source too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds it sounds like with this method we're we're really limited in what the PSCID can do, but that's like the that's the only solution. Well, the thing is, you need to start with something robust because if your tool only works half the time, it's bullshit, <laughs> right? And then yeah. that's 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 how it is. Like if that's what annoys well, me I about mean, Haskell. Like PSCID, it, right, right now it it only kind of works half the time. Well. I, I, I'm, okay, it works a lot of time, but like for some cases, it only works half the time. Because if if I want to like do like if I want to import something, and mm -hmm. then I might I might have, like it's not visible yet because I haven't parsed that. New, like if I make a new module, then like maybe that won't be in PSC IDE. Well, you need it needs to compile at least once before PSC IDE. Right. See, see, like like here, like it only works half the time. Like that one feature of like, please import the symbol for me. It's a it's in a new module. Like that, that doesn't work all the time. That only works like if you if you've already compiled it once. Um, well, I think what you're referring to right now, like, do you expect to be able to import stuff that that doesn't compile yet, like where where there's errors in the definitions? Because that's kind of tricky. <laughs> because how to collect all that information? Like, it needs to be like valid syntax at least for it to be an actual definition. Hmm. Right. Well, there's some value in it, I, I think. Like if you wanna stub, stub out some methods, if you wanna make a new module and just say like, uh, X equals this and X has this type. And then you say yeah. the implementation of X empty. Like, you, I mean, as a programmer, it's still de defined. Here's a method, like here, not, here's a function and it has this type. And then if I want to go do it and do it into like a different source file and say, I want to use that function. It's not done yet, but 
you know, so that's what we, that's kind of what we use tight holes for. And um, or unsafe crash with, but yeah, that's what you use. Un, like we do have undefined, it's called unsafe crash. You can put that in as a definition, of, like as an implementation for that function, but. And, but yeah, but that's kind of, yeah, but, but, but for the, for the purposes of this workflow, it's kind of. I don't think Java lets you do that, to be honest, like anything lets you. But I mean, you, like you could do like a partial parse and then still get, inf still get useful information from a partial part, uh, partial parse. Um, like uh, I'm, I'm just dreaming here. Like I don't have. Any yeah. The, the thing is like presenting wrong information to the user is even worse than not presenting any information. Yeah. Kind of. Because of what that, that's one of the things that annoys me, for example, if you do that, like imports it, like the, Okay. Like if you do the type suggestion, like import the type signature, for, like insert the type signature for something uh -huh. and it does that. And then you end up with errors because you still need to import all the types. That's one thing that really annoys me, for example. If, if, it's like, if, if you write a function that uh, re refers to some types, but you didn't import those types. Is this what no, you're if saying? you write a function and don't write a type signature, the compiler oh. will suggest the type signature to you, right? Yeah. And you can automatically insert that one. Yeah. But then you get errors because you didn't add the imports for all the types that appear in the type signature, right? Right. And that, for example, annoys me. And I'd like to fix that. Why? Well, because that's like the, the editor says, hey, I can help you. Like your code compiles right now. There's a warning, but your code works. Here, let me help you. You say, okay, sure. Give me what you got. And then, yeah, your code is now broken. <laughs> right, that's yeah. just for yeah, well, well, so, so you want, like, uh, you're saying that the, the, the better option would be to uh, fix that solution, fix that uh, suggestion, so that in not only the type signature, but also the import signature. Yeah, right. Don't suggest wrong stuff to me, kind of. Well, it's not wrong. It's... <laughs> right, you broke my code. That's not oh, nice. You're a dreamer. You want to you import? That'd be really, That would be pretty awesome. But yeah, you could. It's not. It's not. Like, it's not super hard to do. You could do that with just like your editor plugin too. It's like whenever you do a type signature completion, then automatically go and like do like import all. Yeah, <laughs> because it's the thing is that it converts it just to strings, and at that point, you lost the information because there might be like ten different data types that are called component. Mm -hmm. But when the error was like the suggestion was generated, the compiler knew exactly from which module. Oh yeah, you got it. Right. Yeah. You but got in it. the suggestion, that's gone because it's just strings. So you need more structure there. Mm -hmm. And that's what the the like the pretty printer paper does that they talked about. It adds structure to certain sections of the document. So it says like type is component, but there's an associated data structure which says component and the module where that comes from is and then when you like hover over it with the mouse for example it shows you what, which module that is from like the interest mode does that interest mode does that yeah they sh they send the text and a bunch like what they do is they send the text and then they send a collection of like uh like annotation objects which have like a source span Attached to them, they say like, uh, yeah, from like from character twelve to fifteen. Also, display this piece of information. The ID plugin send that to the language server. Yeah, exactly. They have like some their own protocol for that. They send like a big chunk of source code to the language server. And the language server sends all kinds of crazy stuff. No, but what they do is it, what they would do in that suggestion that we have, like the compiler, the PSQL compiler. When you have like a type suggestion, what it sends you is just the string for that thing that, that you should put into your editor. Mm -hmm. What the interest compiler sends you is the string that you should put into your editor and then a bunch of meta information about um, that string. That, that, that's the response in the language server. Yeah. Right. Well, okay. and, and then if we had that, it would be trivial to just go and say, yeah, insert that complete and like insert that thing. And then for this meta information, PSAD inf insert all these imports. Uh -huh. Done. Oh yeah. That would be the nice way to do it.
right? And that that would that also solve your uh, function signature? Uh, yeah, exactly. That's and then you can, you can send back multiple suggestions, right? And say this this one goes here, this one goes here, and this yeah. one goes above the function. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah, that, 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 that's pretty. Uh, you're a dreamer, man. <clears throat> and then to come back to that part where you said, yeah, like, but there is information in a fully parsable and compiling module that you ha don't have right now, which I say, yes. <laughs> and I'd love to get at that information, but first I wanted something robust that always works. And then we can, like, we can add like the versions that are nicer. And we can say, try.